for better days to come and carry us like wind in our sails. Hold on tight, I can smell the shore, it's right in front of us if we just hold on tight. This vision that I saw is getting closer every dawn. Dreamers of the absolutely amazing to be here again with you. Um, it's three weeks since I last issued a podcast for St. Patrick's Day and so I'm a little bit early, earlier than my usual month um, between podcasts because I wanted to be free next weekend which is Easter. So um, yeah so here I am and uh, you're all really welcome here. Um, my name is Anya and I am based in the west of Ireland and uh, this is where I live and work and where I knit a lot and um, where I enjoy coming to you from every time I, uh, I put out a podcast. So I, the, the usual content is, I suppose, like most other editing uh, podcasts, I talk about my works in progress, my finished objects, um, ideas I have, inspiration that I have for knitting. But I also do a section at the end of each podcast on Irish culture and traditions and beliefs and um, often to do with nature, um, trees and shrubs. And uh, this time I'm going to be looking at both shrubs, one shrub and an animal. So um, I'm going to be looking at these because they're, they're um, the very topical at this time of the year. So we're going to be looking at gorse which is a plant, a yellow flowered plant, which is really in bloom, fully in bloom now. And I'm going to be looking at the, the hair, the Mad March hair in Irish tradition and folklore and customs. And uh, so that leads into the hair, leads into the whole notion of uh, the whole connection with Easter. So I suppose it's topical for that reason as well. So um, yeah, you're really welcome here. Um, I've had lots of uh, new people joining the channel, new subscribers, so a really warm welcome to all the new people, uh, new viewers out there, and of course to all your um, really amazing returning viewers. Thank you very much for your coming back um, to watch the videos. I'm really thrilled um, that there's such interest in the channel. Um, and a huge big thank you actually as well to uh, a really lovely sweetheart of a podcaster who is based in Dublin uh, on the east coast of the country and his name is Sam uh, from Irish Knitting, the Irish Knitting Podcast and I'm going to link him below. He's a great podcaster and he really kindly mentioned me on his uh, his channel there recently so thanks Sam for that. Um, Sam is an amazing designer as well, he issue, he publishes patterns and he also is an artist, so uh, from Italy originally, uh, but has recently got his Irish citizenship, so that's a really nice thing for him, congratulations Sam, and uh, thank you so much for uh, your interest in, in Freaknitz. 
Freyach, by the way, is the way you pronounce it. I know Sam had difficulty. So Freyach means, um, is the Irish word for Heather. And the reason I have chosen that name for my um, podcast and my Instagram handle actually is the same. It's Freyach Nitz. Uh, the reason I chose them is because I live on the west coast of Ireland um, in a sort of a mountainy, mountainous area where there's lots of heather and um, I just think it's a, it's a beautiful plant and uh, it just is, um, it represents the wildness of the place that I live which I absolutely love and it's also it's a beautiful colour um, but I also love the sound of the name, I love the sound of Freoch. there's something absolutely beautiful about it. I love the Irish language and I try and bring in a little bit of the language as well for you to, um, I suppose, uh, yeah, to, to whet your appetite or to remind you if you already speak it or already use it. Um, yeah, so that's the, where we're at. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here again and I have a good few works in progress to show you um, and I have only one finished object. Um, yeah, so um, the cultural section at the end, as I was saying, I'm going to be talking about Gorse and the Mad March Hare. So if you want to stick around for that at the end, do, and if not, feel free, of course, to, um, to leave at any time. So, um, so what have I been up to? I've been doing a lot of knitting on a lot of different projects, so I haven't really a huge amount finished. I've also been really busy with work. So haven't had very much knitting time. The knitting time is starting to really diminish this time of the year. I've been trying to get out more. I've been out hiking. Um, I've been up Croke Patrick twice since I last spoke to you. So it's really that time of the year where the, the clocks went forward last weekend. So we have this amazing brightness in the evenings and it's just so uplifting. And um, it's really, really just everything. The energy has just risen. It's, it's springtime. It really is a fantastic time of the year. Our weather is up and down all over the place. We get lots of wind. We get lots of rain and um, but there's some days that are almost like summer they're so warm so we're really between not knowing what to wear actually at this time of the year very much okay so i'll get straight into the knitting then um so i am my first finished object or the only finished object that i have to you and maybe it's actually a little bit cheating calling calling it a finished object because it is uh, one sock i'm not sure if i'm uh if I'm entitled to call it a complete finished object because I've only started the money on the cuff of the, the second sock. So this sock is um, a, a design, or at least the pattern that I was following is by Denise of um, Earth Tones Girl. She's known as on her YouTube channel and Instagram, I think. And um, it's called the Sock Explorations uh, pattern. And it demonstrates how to do the shadow wrap heel, um, shadow wrap short row heel. And I was talking to you the last time about wanting to knit more socks because, um, well, I just haven't knit very many because I find them a little bit fiddly and not terribly engaging. But I have to say, I think what was really a bit of a mental block for me about them was the um, the, sh the sorry the the heel flap and gusset. I just found that really hard to memorize, and I'd have to be going back to look at it every time, and really didn't don't even even really like the look of it so much. I find it looks a little bit clunky compared to this type of a heel, which is traditional sock heel for me in my own mind. So yeah, I decided I would go back to this. I've actually knit a pair from that pattern about two years ago, I think. I knit some for Christmas from my sisters, a pair each, and I'll put a photograph up here showing you what they looked like. And when I looked back at that photograph, I said to myself, I actually couldn't, I can knit socks and they look okay and um, I should be using this pattern. Um, but I think I was knitting them for Christmas presents, which actually, that's why it felt like they took forever. So when I knit this, I realized they don't really take that long. Um, and I have to say I absolutely adore using tiny needles. So the needles I used for this was, um, the needle size is 2.25 millimeter and I cast on 64 stitches, such the medium size. So um, yeah, it's uh, just such a pleasure to use tiny needles. And I absolutely love the effect that I managed to get from mixing and matching the merinos, the sing merino singles with uh, silk mohair. So held double. 
and the reason I did this is because I don't have any sock yarn in my stash at all. I, don't, I sort of tend to avoid buying yarn that has nylon in it and I know that um, um, silk mohair uh, combined with uh, merino is known to strengthen the, the fabric and so uh, make the sock more durable. So I just decided I would take, I really was anxious to, or not anxious, but I was suppose itching to use yarns that I had in my stash, which were bought last December in uh, when I made a trip to the Netherlands. And I picked up some gorgeous skeins there, uh, particularly this skein here, the, uh, this is the Walk collection. It's actually quite expensive. It's a, a Merino, Merlino, they call it a linen Merino. So 90% Merino, 10% linen. And I adore the effect that linen has on the look of a yarn. I love that sort of rustic effect, um, beautiful, where the, the linen doesn't really pick up the colour, the dye of the, the yarn. So that's this one here. This is the, I'm not sure what the colourway is, actually I can check it for you here now. It's a funny word, uh, goyati, goyatic? I'm not sure, I can't pronounce that. Oh, Goyaba, as reading the as reading the handwritten thing. So it's G-O-I-A-B-A. -A. Goyaba is the name of the colour. This really sort of neon pink colour. Um, this is attached to the um, the cuff of the second sock. So I've actually started really, really enjoying this. And there's my nice skinny 2.25 millimeter needles, which I'm really enjoying. So I decided I would use, and this one was bought. These were bought in Stephen and Penelope's last December. This one is a um, Malabrigo sock, it's called, and the colour is eggplant, eggplant. And then this one was bought in a different shop in Amsterdam also, uh, the name of which I forget, uh, and it's by a, a Dutch um, independent dyer, um, and she calls her uh, business, is called Volmet Verve. So one with life, um, and I was talking to you about that before. Verfa also has uh, connotations of dyeing, or it's used to express uh, dyeing uh, colors uh, in wool. So these three I picked out of my stash as uh, the main colors for the for the project for the sock project, uh, or sorry, as the. the the, the base colours I suppose and then with the base yarns and then these are the um, silk mohairs that I took from my stash which I was going to combine so I have the green here is Biche Bouche, Le Petit Mohair, the cream colour is from Rowan Kids, it's a Kids Silk, silk Haze and this gorgeous purple colour, Julie purple, is by Pearl Soho. I forget the actual name of it, but it's, they're all silk mohairs. I think they're all 70-30, um, if I'm not mistaken. So the idea behind the project was to use the, the three main colours, that these three um, merinos really. They're, they're all merino except for the, the pink, which has linen in it. The other two are 100%. Merino and my idea was to use these three colours in a row and to overlay on each of them one of the silk mohairs. So the top three stripes are the three colours overlaid with the white, the middle three are the same colours overlaid with the green and these three are overlaid with the purple and then we're back the sequence starts again with the colours overlaid with the white. So that's how I, I just decided I was going to play with the colours and actually it's like mixing paints it's so exciting to see what happens when you you do this it's really really cool to uh, to play with with wool and colours um, so I really adore the the effect that I got and it's a sort of a mild effect it's just amazing what happens when you hold a yarn double um, the way it does this sort of uh, mild effect where depending on the way the yarn is twisted you see one or other colour um, so you get this sort of speckles effect um, and you can see I think I hope you can see that the um, the Rowan Kid Silk Haze is the fluffiest of them and the softest uh, but the other two are also beautiful um, so I'm absolutely thrilled with the uh, outcome of this this sock project 
and um, it's really encouraged me to, to start knitting more socks. It's the one thing in my wardrobe that I actually need more of. I don't need more jumpers, I have so many of them at this stage. Um, and I was already knitting another shawl and I thought, no, I really want to. But initially I bought this pink thinking, and the pink and the uh, eggplant I was thinking of putting into a shawl. But actually then, I don't know, I just thought, I'll do a sock. And, um, and going back to this heel type has really just been fantastic. So I really enjoyed doing the, um, these are shadow wrap short rows. And they're so neat. They look really gorgeous. And they're really easy to memorise. So I highly recommend. Uh, and the other thing is that Denise's um, Earth Tone, Tones Girls uh, videos are fantastic. Her tutorials are absolutely brilliant. So they're really, really highly recommended. Uh, there you go, that's my one finished object this time, so hopefully I think I will easily have the second sock finished because it's such an addictive project. What I find really lovely with stripes is that you always want to get onto the next one to see how they react with each other, the colours, and just to, um, yeah, to see the whole project emerging. It's so exciting, such a lovely thing to do. So that's that project and um, really delighting using up all my stash yarns as well and uh, yarns that I would have bought now for four months ago so it's really lovely to get around to using them finally. Um, so was there anything else I wanted to say? Oh yes somebody as well, I knew there was another point I was going to make about why I chose to just take off with the colours and not worry about what I was doing. I mean it's a great thing about socks you can just play around uh, with stuff and not worry about the outcome really because um, it's not going to be worn in a jumper. You can hide them if they don't work out right because um, they'll be on your feet. But um, the other thing that really inspired me was a podcaster who, who unfortunately I can't remember her name but she was a sock knitter or she was knitting socks and she was saying that um, the sock is like a swatch in itself. You don't really swatch for socks. They are a form of swatching. So in a way you can just play around with whatever you're doing and create something completely unique and completely, um, yeah, from your imagination as you go along. Once you're following the basic, you know, cuff, leg, heel, uh, foot and toe, and um, the rest of it is just it's like a little blank canvas. So really enjoyable to do that. So that was my swatching with those with those colours and actually just to set up a quick look at it again I think I would love to do a sock with just these three colours repeated all the way down because I actually think these are stunning even though at the beginning I was sort of a bit disappointed the way the white covered up the uh, the eggplant so much that you, it looks like a grey colour but anyway just love the, uh, the possibilities there and other projects that could come out of that one. So the other project which you haven't seen yet actually, which is also still a work in progress and anybody who follows me on Instagram will have seen uh, this as a work in progress and will have seen me trying it on uh, before I split for the sleeves. Um, this is uh, the Kevat, uh, I think is how you pronounce it, by Caitlin Hunter. So it's a T, so there, there's just going to be short sleeves and you could have a cropped version or a slightly longer version. I think I'll be doing the longer one. Um, but it is a fantastic pattern. I absolutely love it. And I actually did this, um, this I cast on sort of spontaneously as well, or um, it's been on my list for ages. And actually I did a swatch for it last um, August when I bought the yarn. I did this swatch here, which um, is uh, not the colors I finally used. So the colors are the yarns are Life in the Long Grass, Sport weight, um, semi solid in the colorway storm for the grey, and this red color here is the same yarn but in the barn colorway. And I thought they would go well together, but I just looked at this and I said, No, it's just not doing it for me. I, did, I really wasn't inspired to knit the pattern after doing this swatch, even though I really loved the um. I love the all of the color work and the texture and the pattern is really stunning. But I put this away and didn't think about it, about it anymore until the Irish Cal came up. And the Irish Knit Along, which is organized by At Shunach Yarns, Sophie of At Shunach Yarns and Diane of uh, Dublin Knitworks, or Dublin Knitwork. Um, they organized an Irish Cal and uh, which started on St. Patrick's Day and runs through to June the 3rd. So if, if you haven't, uh, thought of um, casting on to join in. There's still another month, so there's plenty of time. 
but this seemed like the perfect project to do because it is you can use the cow just requires that you use either yarn that's from an Irish independent dyer or a um or a pattern by an Irish designer so and they're by Irish it's people living in this country so <clears throat> people based in Ireland uh, who are dying or who are um doing uh, making patterns writing patterns and publishing them so I just thought I have all of the I have the pattern I had the yarn and I thought I'm just going to knit this for my contribution to the Irish cow and um, I decided that I would use the uh, this colorway here um, this yarn which is also life in the long grass it's merino singles variegated and I can't I think I've been calling this rose colorway but I actually think it's called thorn possibly I don't have it written on the label so uh, and I meant to look it up but Anyway, it's either rose or thorn. So this is has worked out to be absolutely gorgeous in the um, uh, these gorgeous little nups or bobbles um, because each of them looks like a little rosebud. And uh, yeah, so just really thrilled with the way it actually interacts with the grey as well, with the storm colour. And even though it's... So in order to get over the fact that this is a... Uh, a thinner yarn. This is a, a merino. Sorry, it's a fingering weight, um, and the grey is a sport weight. I decided that I would do the color work sections um, in a bigger needle. So I went up a needle size, but unfortunately, I forgot to go down a needle size when I was doing this section of um, of texture. Um, so I just kept going with the same needle size down to about here, and then I changed back. Um, so I don't think it's going to make too much of a difference. I mean, you can see it when you look closely, but I'd say um, I just got cut off there in the middle of talking to you about the um, this project here, the Kevat, and um, yeah, I was just telling you that I had used the wrong needle size, but actually it's fine um, that I hadn't gone down needle size here, but everything's fine. I think it'll be fine once once it blocks out, it'll be won't be noticeable. So the other thing I wanted to tell you about this project was the fact that it there's a lot of lace work um, after the, this lovely textured stuff which I had no problem doing you get onto this lace section. So lace as if you've watched this podcast before you'll know that it's not actually one of my favourite things. Um, I love the look of it in this pattern and that's why I chose to to take this on and to knit it but um, so lace work is something that I have really very little experience doing and I actually found it. Oh, here's Gotto coming up to say hello. Hey Gotto, can you make it? Good boy. You caught up in some of the wool. I think he's caught up in some of the yarn here. Anyway, so yeah, um, lace, lace work is just something that I have no experience, very little experience of and I uh, I found it really hard to read the knitting. Um, like colour work is so simple because you're just going on the basis of the line that you've just done, you know, the row above it, you know, what colour stitch should be on top of each one just according to the, the chart. Whereas with lace work, oh my goodness, I found it so difficult to, to follow what I was doing, especially with the setup round. So luckily my friend Barbara, my good knitting friend Barbara was here, so she was able to tell me you know, you should actually try using um, stitch markers to, to mark out each of the sections so that you can keep track of where you're going because actually it's, I think it is sort of notorious that, that lace work isn't that easy to keep track of. So here they are, all my lovely markers. Um, I have my gorgeous little uh, Dutch Billy as we call them here in Ireland. We actually have uh, houses in Dublin based on these really narrow Dutch houses. We call them Dutch Billies in Dublin. Um, yeah, so a Dutch Billy, I have a, um, I have a bicycle, you can see that one there. I have a lovely ceramic one with a heart from a, a maker in Spain, I think. I have um, some of the little Addy hearts, which you can click open and closed. I have a sheep, which I got from a lovely wool company in, this is my sheep, from a lovely wool company in um, the Netherlands also called Rebel with a Twist. They sent me some lovely yarn. So uh, yeah, really fun knitting with all of these these markers and they've been a lifesaver because I just couldn't keep track of where I was. And even with the markers, I kept making mistakes. I kept, it's, so this bit took me ages to knit because I 
uh, you start off with a purl stitch at the beginning of each section and I was sometimes I was counting the purl stitch and other times I wasn't so I was getting completely uh, lost in the um, the order of the yarn overs and the texture and that so anyway I've solved the problem and I'm much have got much quicker at it um, and know that when I knit the next few sections it won't take me so long so yeah I'm really really enjoying this pattern and Thanks so much to the organisers of the Irish Gal because otherwise I wouldn't have started this this year, I would say. So that's that uh, project and I hope to have that finished for you for the next time I issue a podcast. So the other projects that I have been enjoying doing are um, this lovely shawl here, which I was so excited about the last time, um, the Big Spite shawl. And um, this is the section that I'm on now, and we get this sorted out with the yarn. Okay, so, um, this is this beautiful design by Vera Vanamaki, and uh, as you can see, it's got a lot of brioche in it, it's got a lot of garter, it's got gorgeous colors, and I am onto a really, a section that is really slow. <laughs> so I was doing well when I was on the, the mix of, um, the lovely squishy garter and the, or sorry, the lovely squishy brioche and the garter. And when I was on a mix of that and then into the garter on its own, it was flying. And then I got into this section down here, which is all, um, this is all garter, or sorry, all brioche. And it is, um, let's see if I can show you this, am I showing you the, the back of it there? I should have sorted this out before I started filming. Let's see. Okay. Now you can see. So this section here is all brioche and it is, uh, there's this pattern of two lines going off at a, in a diagonal. And these are just, these were so difficult. I don't know if you can see, there are a few mistakes here. In that, uh, so increasing and decreasing in brioche has been a learning curve for me. I've never done that before. This is my first brioche uh, pattern actually that I've tried, um, and the definitely the increasing and decreasing has been <laughs> challenging. Um, but I think I've got the hang of it now. I really love knitting this though. Um, I love the rhythm of brioche. It's so comforting. There's something really lovely about it. It takes a long time but I just highly recommend knitting. And of course, this pattern is stunning. Uh, and the yarn is like in the long grass as well. So uh, the progress was slow on this, and I've, as I said, have had very um, much less knitting time than normal. So um, yeah, that's it now for the moment. That's where we're at with that project. And I just adore it. I adore this shawl. And I'm really looking forward to, to, to wearing it. Um, so Life in the Long Grass, uh, Merino Singles, and the colourways I will put in the description down below. They're the, um, let's see if I can remember them, oh yeah, this is called Tiller, and this is called Pewter, and this is the Rose or Thorn colourway that I'm using for the, um, for the Caitlin Hunter top, um, for the Irish Cal. So I was in two minds as to whether to actually go ahead and use this for that other project because I, I was actually thinking, will I try and finish the shawl first before I start the kebab top? And I thought, no, I'll risk it. And if I need to, I can always buy more. But actually, luckily enough, luckily enough I have this much left of the, uh, the thorn. And this comes into this pattern again. The shawl ends with a series after this is quite a long section. I think I'm about a third of the way through this brioche section, so it's a good bit more to go. And after that, there's more of the red that comes in again with the brown, red and brown together in a brioche uh, stitch that goes lengthwise. So you've got this long line running across the bottom of the shawl. So hopefully I'll have enough net left for that, but I'm thrilled with my decision to use that same color in my kibat. So yeah, that's the back of the shawl there. You can see more of the pewter colour on the back. Um, really loving that project. It's absolutely gorgeous and quite addictive knitting. But as I was saying to you, it's actually slow. It's slow knitting and um, yeah, I'm dividing my time between all these projects at the moment, but thoroughly enjoying all of them. 
And another one then that I picked up, um, and this is one that you've seen loads of, and I'm hoping to finish this by uh, July, <laughs> which is when I started last year. Um, so this is my lovely Decision Cardigan by Anka Strick. Now I um, decided I would to, so that the inertia wouldn't take hold with this project because this tends to just sit in the background. Every time I pick it up, I enjoy knitting on it, but it doesn't really spark my enthusiasm, um, especially at this time of the year because it's a sort of a rust colour, so it's a bit more wintry and autumny, autumnal, but um, I decided anyway, I better pick it up just to keep going at it and keep the momentum. So I decided to uh, start with, I pretty much finished the body, as I was telling you the last time, I haven't done the uh, bind off yet because I want to do a, an Italian uh, bind off, stretchy bind off on that um, and I just didn't want to start into that because it's time consuming so I decided I would cast on for or pick up the stitches for one of the sleeves. So that's what I did and I have to say, oh my god, this was such an enjoyable sleeve to do because um, the, the pattern is so well written and I think I've made that point the last time talking about in my last podcast talking about Anka Strick's uh, shoulder uh, treatment of the shoulders in her patterns is always unusual and always really well designed in terms of shaping so this is a I hope I'm not giving too much away by saying it's done by short row shaping um, so you do short rows in this ribbed section until you get around to the um, to the cable pattern again. So as you can see, I was very excited doing the, the short row rib and I got to the cables and I got as far as, where am I? I'm actually only halfway through the second cable and I put it to one side again. So the cables are tedious, I suppose. Uh, you could say, I am just I just love this. Uh, the finished product is going to be something I will definitely adore. It's so warm. It's um, silk mohair held double with um, De Rerum Natura, uh, the sport weight version, the Ulysse uh, version of De Rerum Natura's yarn. Um, and I think it's called Erable is the colorway for the, um, the De Rerum Natura. And I think it's Gold Oak is the Ito Sensai uh, silk mohair that I'm holding a double with. Um, the pattern is gonna have a zip down the middle and a gorgeous stand-up collar um, and beautiful ribbing under the sleeves, so there's a rib section underneath the cable section on the sleeves, just a gorgeous pattern, really, really well worth. I, I even I keep looking at the colour she has in the sample that she has, has on her pattern, and it's a blue colour, it's a sort of a pale duck egg, maybe not duck egg, but it's a pale blue, and it's just gorgeous. Um, even though it's not my colour, I just look at it and think, should I have knit, knit that colour? But I don't think it would suit me. I think this is probably more me. So, um, yeah, there you go. That's that project. Really, really enjoying it. And um, these were some markers, progress keepers, just showing how far I was getting, just to keep the momentum going. Um, but I'm delighted to finish the body and thrilled to have started the sleeve. So I'm very excited to continue on with that and keep keep going and try not to get distracted by all the nice colourful things that I've been knitting recently. So that's the third work in progress and then I have one more to show you and it is only just cast on. So this has only just been cast on. This is the, um, the downtown hoodie that I'm doing in the uh, Old Centrum. Anthracite is the name of this, so it's sport weight, woolly woolly um, yarn from Sweden, from Gotland, and uh, yeah, this is just the, the start of it. So um, tricky enough actually at the beginning because you've got uh, a raglan and um, you're doing short row shaping with the raglan increases, which is the same actually as the Felix, which I'm wearing. There's a tricky part at the beginning of that which involves short row shaping and raglan increases, which I actually think if you can separate the two out, I don't know if there's some way of doing that. It just makes it easier. But anyway, um, it's just a lot of concentrating and counting and making sure you're in the right place. But I just love the way this knits up. It's so beautiful, such beautiful yarn. My favorite, I think, Old Centrum has to be one of my favorite ever yarns. Uh, so really looking forward to getting a bit farther with this project. 
Uh, it's literally just started. Oh, and the stripes, I was going to do them in a grey, but I think now I'm going to go for this gorgeous, I think it's called Falu Red. This is my colour. Uh, red is definitely something I'm attracted to. Reds and pinks. Um, not not in total like you couldn't wear, I couldn't wear a whole jumper of red but I love red coming into uh, other neutral colors like brown or gray like uh, the shawl I'm knitting even the, the the browns in that with the reds and the gray and the red with um with the cavat top so definitely red and black uh so the downtown hoodie stunning pattern um yeah so that's pretty much it for works in progress and um, there are no plans for any other projects at the moment. I know last week I was talking about knitting the, that dress by Vera Vadamaki, but I haven't, I'm not going to go starting that until I have got through and finished a few projects because I have a lot on the go at the moment. Um, and I really want to try and finish the decision cardigan before the summer, um, just to get it done. And I also I know I'll finish the Kevat top quickly because that is no sleeves and the shawl will be done um, reasonably quickly and I'm going to cast on more socks I think the next time it's definitely something I need more of in my wardrobe and I'm having great fun with that particular uh, sock design. Um, so that's it for the knitting content, not much to show you this week, well maybe um, um, hopefully more next time in terms of finished objects but I hope you've enjoyed that and um, I'll be talking to you now about the um, Irish cultural section so if you're happy enough to uh, leave it at that thank you so much for watching and if you've liked this content please click on the subscribe button if you haven't already and please click like and maybe leave a comment below. I love reading the comments um, and I reply to them all so far at the moment. I'm managing to get to them all. Um, they're just fantastic. It's just such a lovely feeling of connection. Um, and people have, the people who've commented, all my lovely viewers who've commented, thank you so much. It's just wonderful to hear your opinion on things and get advice and, um, you know, just different uh, inspiration that you've got from, from the content and from what I'm talking about. Uh, so it's really, really encouraging. It really makes me want to put more out there. It gets me, you know, into the mode of, of, of wanting to, to show you more stuff. So thank you very much. And um, we'll be moving on to the next section. Hi, everyone again. Um, I am um, just going to talk to you now about the... Uh, the plant, the Irish plant and the cultural traditions associated with it known as gorse. So gorse is uh, an incredible uh, plant that flowers nearly all year in Ireland um, and it grows wild in the fields and it covers, especially in parts, large parts of the west of Ireland, it, it takes over fields actually um, and it has a really really bright acidic yellow flower and the reason I have chosen to talk to you today about gorse is because um, I recently went walking on uh, up Croke Patrick um, on two occasions actually, once a week ago and also yesterday and um, the gorse is just, uh, particularly a week ago we had a really warm day, a warm spring day and once the sun comes out and the weather gets warm the gorse flowers start to smell of an incredible smell of coconut. It's absolutely unbelievable, this really sort of heady um, scent um, really strong scent of coconut it's absolutely beautiful and it's just completely wild so and it's everywhere and we sort of take it for granted and I thought I actually know very little about this plant so I want to talk to you about gorse but I also want to talk to you about another thing that I've been seeing in the countryside recently on my walks and out about when I'm working and that's the um, the hare the wild animal the hare um, that is just going crazy at the moment because it's mating season so it's uh, the mad march hare is about out and about in the Irish countryside in force they're everywhere and they're just so such beautiful creatures they come bounding out of nowhere and then they disappear as soon as you've uh, as soon as you've seen them they just disappear again so they're really hard to catch on camera so no footage of those but I do have footage of uh, lots of gorse bushes to show you from my walks at the end of the uh, of the podcast. 
So I think Ruben is waving to me here. He wants to come in and say hello to you all. You haven't hello. seen him in a while. So <laughs> yeah. So it's good to see everybody out there in, in YouTube land. So all uh, I can see is a camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good man, Ruben. Thanks for coming in to say hello. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye now. So, uh, that was nice to see Ruben for a few minutes wearing his um, Winter Fox sweater, which um, you would have seen on one of the previous podcasts. He wears it every single day. So, he's a really knitworthy person, the most knitworthy person I've, uh, I know in my life anyway. So, the gorse plant uh, is featured in this beautiful book which I've shown before on my podcast by Neil McCutcher called Ireland's Trees and um, Ireland's Trees, Myths, Legends and Folklore and the hair is in this book which I only realised existed uh, very recently. I didn't have this until during the week I picked it up in a local bookshop and it's called Ireland's Animals, Myths, um, again Myths, Legends and Folklore by Neil McCutcher. So um, he has published altogether four in this series. So there is the one on trees, the one on plants, the one on animals, and um, the fourth one is on birds, actually, Irish birds. So they're really beautiful books and they're full of fascinating information. And they really are, for me, a reminder of a whole part of our culture that I sort of know little bits about. And I might have heard bits here and there, but it's just great to read even more and um, more about our folklore, actually, which is just folklore is actually full of wisdom. I reckon it's something that we should pay more attention to than we do. And I think in this sort of modern world where everything is, is sort of quite scientific and folklore tends to be maybe put to one side and seen as not important. Um, but it's certainly, for me, become more and more important uh, the older I get and the more, um, yeah, the more I think that, that, that they're, it's the voice of the people who lived um, before us, our ancestors, and just generations and generations of um, uh, an understanding of the land particularly and of our wild animals and our wild plants. Uh, an understanding that we've sort of lost and forgotten about, even though we're surrounded by these beautiful creatures and beautiful plants all the time. So anyway, this is uh, where I've got the information for this section of the podcast. So the hares and the gorse, these are the two things that are really, have really sort of been in my um, experience over the last couple of weeks and have really inspired me. And they're both symbols of springtime and fertility and wealth. And um, they are just the, the signs of the beginnings of uh, the, the approach to summer. So uh, they're very much associated with um, um, Easter as well. So, and I know Easter is happening next weekend and this is so quite appropriate to, to talk about the, the gorse and the hare. So um, gorse can be known as, uh, in this country, it's known also as furs, F-U-R-Z-E, or when, W-H-I-N, depending on what part of the country you're in. But I grew up knowing it as gorse. Um, and they're, um, the blossoms, as I said, are this absolutely incredible yellow. So I'll put some footage at the end, which will show you how beautiful they look and they have this beautiful scent. And the scent really comes out, the coconut smell comes out when the sun comes out. And if you get a warm day in springtime, it's just fantastic to, to smell this. Um, so they are an amazing uh, shrub or bush and they are, a, a, in folklore, they are a symbol of wealth uh, and fertility, fertility of the land. Um, the branches are evergreen and they flower at all times. I think there are two different varieties and they, so they cover the whole year round. So this is always in flower pretty much, even although they, during the winter time, maybe the, the flowers are fewer but in the summertime, they are abundant and in springtime. So I've got some here to show you. So this is what um, the gorse plant looks like. So I'm gonna be really careful picking this up because it's full of, of thorns, really, really harsh, uh, strong spines. So it makes it very difficult to, <laughs> to pick. Um, I cut some of these this morning and it's absolutely incredible. They smell of coconut, it's really, or as, as somebody said, I wonder does the coconut smell of gorse? <laughs> so it's it's one of the they're interchangeable smells. They're unbelievable. So um, 
they're stunning. So this is what it looks like. So the whole countryside at the moment is covered. This is a really uh, bushy piece here. Um, the whole countryside around me at the moment is covered in this bright yellow and dark green um, gorse bushes. And um, they are, so they're a sign of fertility. They are, um, they're a sign of wealth. So in folklore, there's an old Irish saying, which um, I'll read it to you in Irish first and then translate it. So it's an tór fwein atin, an tárgat fwein lúchar, agus an gurta fwein vreach. So an tór fwein atin, atin is the Irish word for gorse, coming from two words, a, a, or at, which means um, sharp, and ten, which means uh, lacerated. So <laughs> that's it, sharp and las lacerating. Atin, so it's sharp, lacerating, and that's very much the way it is. You can hardly touch, go near the plant to, to, to pick the flowers um, without getting um, pricked by the, the, the thorns. They're really, really harsh. Um, so Atin is the, is the Irish word. So an tor for Atin means gold underneath the gorse plant. An tarragat for Lúcher is silver under rushes. And an gurta for which means salmon under heather. So vreach, vreach, uh, vreach nits, famine under heather. So it's really a, uh, it shows how um, highly thought of gorse was. It was, it was, if you had gorse in your land, it was, it was valuable land. So it was gold. Uh, rushes were also seen as somewhat valuable. I suppose they were used in uh, thatching. They were used for roofs. Uh, they were used for making baskets, for making all sorts of receptacles. Um, and heather then, famine under heather, so on Gurta, Fwyn, Vreach, and uh, I suppose any land that's covered in heather is mountainous and hilly and doesn't, isn't good for farming. Um, so it was, um, yeah, just a sign of fertility, a sign of uh, wealth, and um, it's uh, also uh, food and fuel, it was used for fuel, for burning, for uh, kindling, it was used for, uh, unbelievably actually, for food, uh, for um, uh, horses and cattle, so I don't know how. I think maybe when it's when it's uh, dried out that it, it's not uh, prickly. It doesn't. It's because I can't imagine cattle eating uh, with those uh, those really sharp thorns. But certainly it was it was fodder for cattle and for horses. Um, it was also uh, the bushes were also used as shelter for animals um, and also for uh, just in field boundaries. But they're also used for building shelters for animals that were kept far away from a farm or a farmhouse. So there are lots of folk tales connected with gorse, um, and they c which connect the, uh, the plant to wealth and money. And I'm going to tell you one of these now that's from the book that's really fascinating. So the story goes that one day a farmer follows a cow down to a furze bush or a gorse bush at the bottom of his field. He hits the cow with a stick and resolves to sell it. A voice from the furze bush asks him, not to do that until the cow has calved. Realising that it is the fairies who speak, he stays, he obeys, um, and uh, the cow gives great milk from then on. And not only that, but the following Samhain, he is taken magically back to New York, where he had worked, previously worked, and helped to retrieve a large sum of money owed to him. So, um, just this association with uh, witches, or sorry, with the uh, not witches, but uh, with the fairies. So these bushes are associated with fairy magic uh, and with wealth, obviously. So there's another story that goes that the ghost of a local chieftain appears from a gorse bush to a poor tenant farmer and gives him enough gold coins to pay his rent in full before riding off on a white horse into a nearby lake. After the landlord's agent has accepted the money, the money and given a receipt for it, the coins then turn into gingerbread. So it's a real sort of, um, you know, the, the mag magical world giving wealth to the poor uh, and supporting the poor uh, against uh, the, the landlords. Um, so the other uses for the, the gorse bush are for dyeing, so it was used for dyeing clothes. It was also used at Easter time for dyeing in Ulster, particularly in Northern Ireland, for dyeing eggs. So eggs would have been boiled in, um, in water. And actually I should have said to you that I'm drinking gorse tea at the moment, gorse flower tea. So um, beautiful yellow liquid, which is full of nutrients. 
so um, it's just here's to here's to Easter time and, and gorse bushes and uh, it's absolutely stunning. You don't really get the coconut flavour at the moment in the tea. I think later in the year when the sun has done its magic you get a little bit more of a coconut flavour in the tea. Um, so Ulster, in Ulster the eggs were boiled in this water so you can see the yellow colour was perfect for dyeing the eggs for Easter time um, and the eggs were then rolled down the hills uh, for sport uh, and then eaten after that. So that was a tradition, a very strong Irish tradition was the um, decorating of eggs, rolling them down hills um, and they were real eggs there so they were would have been hard boiled so eaten following all of that, uh, never wasting anything. Um, on May Day then, um, the gorse branches were brought into the house uh, or they were, else they were placed over the door in the thatch for luck uh, and to bring in the summer. So what a lovely idea, bringing in the summer. Um, and next, the next episode I'm going to be looking at Bialtana, which is May Day. So there's so much associated um, traditions that happen around May Day, which is the first day of summer, or also known as Bialtana, one of the, uh, the main um, of the four main festivals of the year, so welcoming in the summer. Um, a sprig of gorse was also placed around milk or butter at May time to protect it from the fairies um, and it was used as fuel for May bonfires, so very much associated with spring and the beginnings of summer. But it's a blossom um, that is around for most of the year and there's a well-known expression has it that when gorse is out of bloom, kissing is out of fashion. So um, in other words, it's never, it's never out of fashion, it's never out of bloom. Um, and in some parts of England, this led to a sprig of gorse being inserted into bridal bouquets. So that's uh, pretty much um, all there is to, to tell you about it. Um, just again, that it was burnt. Oh yeah, the interesting thing about it, it was burnt uh, in spring and summer to encourage um, young shoots for cattle and livestock to eat. Um, and the ashes then that fell from the partially burnt or from the burnt plants or bushes would fertilize the land uh, beneath. Um, I've also heard that the, um, the seeds that it releases into the ground will stay there for 30 years, even if they don't germinate. So. Um, it's notoriously difficult to get rid of this plant and it's abundant everywhere around and I think today farmers don't particularly um, like it as far as I know. Um, they find uh, they're tr constantly trying to cut, cut it back and keep it under control um, but in traditionally in, in the past in Ireland it was seen as, as a great, uh, just had so many uses. It was a great plant and it was, it was valued and land with it was valued. Land that had gorse growing on it was, was considered wealthy land. Um, that's it really. Um, the, oh yeah, Diana Beresford Kruger then in her, um, uh, her book To Speak for the Trees. If you haven't seen my previous podcasts, this is Diana Beresford Kruger's amazing book. And she is a, a bio, biologist or a biochemist, I'm not sure, living in Canada now. And she has linked, she, she has um, inherited a huge amount of, um, of the Irish uh, tradition of uh, the medicinal qualities and the medicinal um, aspects of plants, of wild plants in Ireland. Um, so she's linked them to modern biochemistry and shown how you know, what was seen in folklore as medicinal or seen in traditional herbal medicine in this part of the world is actually being shown in terms of scientific analysis to be perfectly true and, and why wouldn't it be? You know, why don't we believe that these things, that folklore has something to tell us? But certainly Diana Beresford Kruger has shown that um, very much our folk traditions are um, had a lot of science behind them. They had a lot of weight behind them, really. Um, so yes, yeah, she talks about, she tells that the Druidic physicians used gorse for their medicine. And particularly gorse honey um, is still considered a healing honey um, and it contains an immense diversity of biochemistry. It was used on the battlefield historically um, on open wounds as a natural antibacterial for the skin and she talks more about that in the book it's really her book is really fascinating so um that's pretty much all there is to say about course 
it's just beautiful, it's everywhere and you'll see it in the in the footage that I put at the end of our climb up Crook Patrick. So I climbed Crook Patrick twice in the last uh, while, the last week or so and the first time was with um, a group of scouts that my, my son is in, is with and we had a beautiful day for it. It was the perfect day for the, the children, 9 to 12 year olds who um you know who came up the mountain we got as far as the shoulder and that that was our aim we didn't go to the very top of the mountain but it was a stunning day the sun came out and a really really beautiful climb and at the bottom of the mountain there is uh, there's tons of gorse there which i took a photo a film of so i'll show that to you at the end um so then the hair then i was going to talk to you a little bit about the hair which is also associated with easter of course so we have the gorse uh, colouring the east, the, the eggs yellow for decorating for Easter and the hair then being associated with the goddess Eastra and it's noted in Irish folklore for its swiftness, its alertness and its agility but it was also regarded as a fairy animal associated with deception and witchcraft. In myth uh, the hair was linked linked to Celtic goddesses of fertility, both of the spring and the harvest. So I'm going to talk to you about the hair in, in terms of its spring associations and its associations with witchcraft, which is absolutely fascinating as well. So you can sort of understand why it might be thought of or associated with, um, with deception and witchcraft because it's so fast. I haven't had a chance to I've seen so many hares recently out of my walks in the countryside, but it's impossible to catch them on film because once you see them, they're gone within a second. So it's almost like they're magical creatures that they just appear quickly and then they're next minute you don't know where they are, they've completely disappeared. And they're just huge animals actually. They're about, I think they're probably about that tall with the big long ears and the white tails. So they're like rabbits, but much bigger, um, much bigger creatures. And they have craft. So a very widespread belief among Irish country people was that witches would go abroad in the form of a hare in order to steal milk, especially on May Day. And to prevent this theft from happening, um, the fields would be sprinkled with holy water on May Day. So amazing connect associations between folklore and Christianity again coming through there. Um, and this belief, the belief that hares were an old woman in disguise or a calioch uh, or a fairy in disguise um, is perhaps the reason behind why people traditionally didn't eat hair um, or certainly in certain parts of the country, I know down in Kerry they didn't, uh, it was considered unlucky to, to eat hair and that in fact if you ate a hair you'd be eating the soul of your one of your ancestors possibly. So um, the absolutely incredible how um, these these things are, you know, they, they were around until very recently at least these beliefs. Um, so the most common version anyway of the story, I'm going to tell you uh, the story about um, the Calich or the old woman disguised as a, a hare and going about stealing milk. Um, I'm going to tell you that story now, it's absolutely brilliant, I'll read it to you from, from the book. Um, and it goes like this, that a dairy farmer became suspicious one day uh, when the milk yield, or over a period of time the milk yield noticed milk yield was diminishing. Uh, of his cattle considerably so he's thinking what's going on here he began to stay up at night then to watch the cows and see what was going on to see what what was happening was was it being stolen and indeed he saw a hare then come in one night and drink milk from the cows so the farmer's dog then chased the hare um, but succeeded only in drawing blood from the hindquarters and the hare got away um, uh, and the dog went after it the farmer then went after the two the dog and the hare and um, followed on uh, finally coming to a house nearby and asked the old woman in the house had she seen the hare that he was chasing um, and despite the woman's denials anyway the farmer noticed that she was bleeding from her leg oh my god what an incredible story so he realized it sends chills down your spine to think he realized then this old woman was actually the hare who'd been in disguise stealing the milk what a fantastic uh, story. Um, the sprinkling of the fields with the holy water, then there's a fabulous story associated with that. One tale tells how a farmer accidentally sprinkled a hare who was actually hiding in the grass and as soon as the holy water touched the hare it turned into an old woman, the hare did, um, and was crouched down in terror caught in the act of stealing the milk. 
So, uh, so these were very strong uh, folk tales, um, which really associated this animal with with the Kalich or with the, the old woman. So they were the hares. Then were involved in several folk cures, uh, perhaps because of their speed. Their feet were considered especially potent. Um, and in England, up until recent times, it was thought that the right foot of a hare kept in the left pocket, uh, or left hand pocket of your jacket, would cause, or sorry, would cure, would cure for rheumatism. And a similar thing in Ireland, though also associated with curing rheumatism, was to hang the paw of a hare around your neck on May Day. Again, this May Day is such a significant day date, and I'm really looking forward to telling you a little bit more about that. In the next episode, we'll be looking at Bialtana. It'll be the beginning of May when, when I record that. So cramps and rheumatism were which be cured by hanging the paw of a hair um, around your neck. Um, then there's a proverb about the hair, which is fabulous, an Irish proverb, um, which is, I'll read it to you in Irish first and then translate. So it's Tour de Fog de Rush and Gurig, which means uh, you might as well kiss kiss the hair, or sorry, kiss the foot of the hair. Toward the folk, uh, kiss the Khushangari to the foot of the hair, and it meant to say goodbye to something forever. So fabulous lilt and rhythm to tour the folk, the Khushangari means you might as well forget about that, it's gone forever. And so true of the hair, they just vanish like that, out of sight. As soon as you've seen them, they're gone. So they were generally, as I said before, hairs were linked with springtime because of the uh, prominence of the Mad March here, where they're all running about like crazy in the fields um, and uh, fighting with each other for, for mating season. Um, and back to the association with the goddess Istra, the spring goddess, um, so who was later associated with the festival Easter. And um, yeah, so that brings us back around to this lovely association with the hair, even though it wasn't the, 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 the Easter Bunny tradition didn't exist in Ireland. It's not a traditional thing here, but certainly the dyeing of the eggs and the rolling the eggs down the hill for sport, um, all of these were um, are very strong um, traditional uh, customs here, and uh, and the hair associated with all of that, and uh, and the the lovely gorse associated with it. So with that, I think I will wrap up for this episode. I hope you've enjoyed the stories and the myths and the legends uh, of the um, the hair and the gorse bushes and the witchcraft and uh, the magic. Um, it's been a pleasure being with you as always. And thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate all your views and your comments. Um, and uh, please keep on commenting. It's so lovely to read them. It's such a lovely community. Um, and yeah, and also subscribe if you haven't done so already. It really helps the channel and it helps it to get out to more people. Um, so I hope you all have a lovely, lovely Easter. I hope you all can get out in the open, enjoy the spring sunshine, enjoy the gorse if you have it near you. You might even uh, pick a few flowers and make gorse tea and you can make a cordial from it as well. It's really beneficial, really healthy. Um, full of nutrients um, and it helps you to appreciate this plant which is just it's out there everywhere I'm sure other parts of the world have it not just Ireland um, yeah just really enjoy the Easter break and uh, have a lovely time I hope you um, get lots of Easter eggs and um, don't eat too many too much chocolate uh, I'm sure we'll all be eating plenty of chocolate over Easter um, and uh, yeah have a lovely time thank you so much for watching and see you next time Bye for now.
wanna take you there Someone like me 